Hello, and welcome to Stories Behind the Songs. I'm Jim Tompkins, and on each episode, I tell the true backstory behind a famous rock or pop song. Today's song is Bulls on Parade by Rage Against the Machine. Bulls on Parade is, in my opinion, one of the best hard rock songs that was ever created. Musically, the song's a powerhouse with a couple of unbelievable guitar hooks in it, but it's the message within the song that makes it so memorable, a message that I initially was completely wrong about. Before telling you the story of what it's really all about, let's take a look at this very interesting band itself. Rage Against the Machine is formed in 1991 by a collection of four guys with completely different backgrounds. Lead guitarist Tom Morello is a Harvard grad raised on heavy metal and punk rock who grows up in Illinois. He's born to an American school teacher and a Kenyan diplomat. Next, we have Zach De La Rocha, the lead vocalist, who's a Mexican-American who experiences racism in his youth in California and is a hip-hop guy who struggles to get through high school. Then we have bassist Tim Comerford, who's a Californian whose childhood is rocked by his mother's diagnosis and eventual death due to brain cancer. And finally, Brad Wilk the drummer grows up in Portland, Chicago, and ultimately Southern California, and is influenced heavily by classic rock and roll. You put these four guys together and you get some interesting stuff. The one thing all four members have in common, though, is they are opinionated and politically idealistic, and they're not afraid for a second to speak their mind. And the music this amalgamation produces has all kinds of interesting elements. Hard rock, hip-hop, punk rock, alternative rock, funk. It's almost impossible to sum up in a word what their musical genre is, because really, they are a unique band in American music history. They start playing together in a San Fernando Valley rehearsal room in early 1991, with an attitude of being perfectly willing to agitate and confront. Tom Morello describes the sound, a result of their very different musical influences, as a middle ground between Public Enemy and The Clash. Within a few months, they have a 12-song demo and start getting lots of attention from record companies. As Morello recalls, it was a bunch of guys in suits just salivating, all offering these exorbitant amounts of money for punk rock songs. Their debut album, Rage Against the Machine, is released in November 1992. The cover of the album tells you everything you need to know about the band's personality. It was the Pulitzer Prize winning photograph of a Vietnamese Buddhist monk burning himself to death in Saigon in 1963. His act was in protest of the murder of Buddhists by the U.S.-backed Prime Minister of Vietnam. Album sales of Rage Against the Machine start off slow but gradually gain steam. Within a few years, the album sells over 1 million copies in the United States and 3 million copies worldwide. The album's success, as is the case with so many bands that hit it big, is a total surprise, and the band tours relentlessly to support it. As drummer Brad Wilk said, the first record came out and we went on the road for three years straight, living together on a bus. When you do that, it's pretty easy to kind of get sick of each other, and we needed a break. But do they take a break? Of course not. They decide to try and strike while the iron is hot. They dive right into recording the next album in a recording studio in Atlanta with producer Brendan O'Brien. But there's two problems with this. Number one, they fight. As Brad Wilk said, we go into rehearsal to make a second record and all the personal differences that we swept under the rug when we were touring suddenly came up and we had to deal with them. I felt like the band could have fallen apart then. Each member has their own strong opinions, both musically and politically, and that can make it very hard to compromise and work together. And complicating everything is the fact that all four are so different culturally. The second problem is the studio itself. As Tom Morello said, why spend $2,000 a day in some fancy recording studio trying to recreate the great vibe that we have? Zach De La Rocha added, we weren't going to go in and play in a studio that just had no environment whatsoever. You get in some of these places and it's like you're walking into a dentist's office. I've had my teeth cleaned, thanks a lot. I don't want to do that. So they decide to record the next album, titled Evil Empire, in their Los Angeles rehearsal space. We literally knocked a hole in the wall, rented the room across the hall, and ran the wires over the hallway, said De La Rocha. With some cooler heads and working on their familiar home turf, the band puts together Evil Empire. The album is released on April 16, 1996, and enters the Billboard 200 chart at number one. It sells 250,000 copies in its first week. The second single from the album is a song with a very enigmatic and intriguing title, Bulls on Parade. As I'd mentioned, the song has a powerful message, but what is it all about? 
When I first heard this song, I assumed it was about gang warfare and shooting people up due to the lyrics of rally round the family with a pocket full of shells. In my mind, I imagine when gang warfare flares up, the family, i.e. the gang, groups together and arms up. Then years ago, I was sure I read something where it was not about that, but a statement about gun violence, where Bulls on Parade references the Republican Party that stands on a platform of family values, yet supports a gun movement that results in casualties to families. Well, it wasn't either of those things. Instead, it's a specific and searing statement on the military-industrial complex. That is, all the huge companies that profit by selling war machinery to the largest governments in the world, including, of course, the United States. With that understanding, it's odd that the beginning of the first verse of Bulls on Parade doesn't seem to have anything to do with these topics at all. Instead, it starts more like a rap song, with De La Rocha rapping about his lyrical skill. De La O is Revolutionary General Genovevo De La O, who fought during the Mexican Civil War. So you can see De La Rocha's Mexican heritage influence there. But it's hard to see exactly where that fits in with the rest of the lyrics. It's the second part of the first verse where De La Rocha really gets down to business. The five-sided fistagon that is the rotten sore on the face of Mother Earth is the Pentagon. And what he's saying is that one of the big reasons wars are fought is for money. In the second verse, he gets even more pointed with his commentary. His feeling is that the arms industry encourages war to obtain military contracts. War is a beast, and these companies are just feeding the beast. And he's just getting warmed up with these lines that follow. With the refrain of rally round the family, pockets full of shells, he seems to be pointing out the irony of government officials and politicians who proclaim to be both pro-family and pro-war. And as far as the title, Bulls on Parade, which is sung only on the song's outro, it's hard to know exactly what he's getting at. <laughs> Is it a reference to a bull market, which is when the stock market is seeing share prices rising, which usually prompts an increase in buying? One could draw the line that he's implying that the government is on a buying spree. Or is he just referring to the bull animal, which has an aggressive nature? There he'd be showing the parallel to the aggressive nature of the big defense contractors. Or is he referring to the bull elephant logo of the Republican Party, since Republicans have often been more associated with military spending particularly in the 1980s during the Reagan administration. That would have been the era when De La Rocha and the members of Rage Against the Machine were in their formative years. It's hard to know exactly what the meaning is, mainly because I couldn't find any examples of Zach De La Rocha directly talking about the term. So I'll have to leave it as a mystery unless anybody else knows for sure. And if you do, please leave a comment about it. Logistically speaking, the song is as much a total band effort as you'll ever see. De La Rocha wrote all the lyrics. Tom Morello came up with the wah-wah guitar part and also the music underneath the verses, influenced by the music of the Ghetto Boys. Brad Will came up with the artillery marching beat drum track. And bassist Tim Comerford came up with that unbelievable riff that opens the song. <laughs> That riff was first intended to be the song's coda, but it was producer Brendan O'Brien who zeroed in on it and suggested they try beginning the song that way. Tom Morello recalls it was exactly what the song needed. That's why he's Brendan O'Brien. The album is released in April of 1996. Along with this, Rage Against the Machine is scheduled to be on Saturday Night Live on April 13, which is now quite an infamous performance. 
The problems of that performance start during rehearsal, when Rage Against the Machine's crew members hang two American flags upside down on the lattice of the bass and guitar amps. They think that'll be okay, but the NBC reps say, uh-uh. Why? Because they don't want to piss off their corporate sponsors and don't want to offend Steve Forbes, the former presidential candidate and billionaire who's hosting the show. So it turns into a big dispute but in the end, Rage Against the Machine agrees to not put up the flags. But it's an empty promise, and they have no intention of following the wishes of the Saturday Night Live producers. During the Saturday daytime dress rehearsal, there's no problem because the band doesn't put up the flags. Then it's showtime. Tom Morello recalls what happened next. We're standing on stage 30 seconds before we're to begin performing Bulls on Parade. Steve Forbes is waiting to introduce us. 25 seconds. 20 seconds. Our roadies unfurl the upside-down flags. There's a panic among the SNL stagehands who rush to the stage to get the flags down. They're yelling, take the flags down! The countdown is 15, 14, 13. A melee ensues on stage where our crew is grappling with their crew over the duct tape on the flags. They're successful in removing the flags as the time ticks down to 5, 4, 3, 2 seconds. Steve Forbes introduces us. We play Bulls on Parade. As soon as the song ends, though, the show's producer, Marcy Klein, tells Rage's manager, you guys are out of here. There will be no second song, no cozy wave goodnight at the end, no hugging Steve Forbes. It's just get the hell out of the building right now. Bassist Tim Comerford is so pissed off that he takes one of the torn down U.S. flags, shreds it up, charges into Steve Forbes' dressing room, and hurls it at his entourage. Later, outside the NBC studios, Tom Morello is approached by several members of the cast and crew who actually express their solidarity with Rage Against the Machine and feel really embarrassed about the whole situation. And that is the story of how the song Bulls on Parade was introduced to the world. As for the song's reception, in the U.S. it goes to number 11 on the Billboard Alternative Airplay chart. The song's not a big commercial hit, but that's typical of Rage Against the Machine, it's the albums they sell huge numbers of. After Evil Empire, the band releases just one more original album, 1999's The Battle of Los Angeles, which was another big success. But in 2000, Zach De La Rocha announces he's leaving the band due to too many differences within it. That is the story of Bulls on Parade by Rage Against the Machine. Here are a few other interesting facts about the song and the band. After De La Rocha leaves Rage Against the Machine, the rest of the band joins up with Soundgarden frontman Chris Cornell and form a supergroup called Audio Slave. They have quite a successful run before disbanding in 2007. Rage Against the Machine then reforms, and they've been an off-again, on-again touring band ever since. There's a guitar riff in the song that sounds just like a vinyl record scratching effect, like what you hear in rap songs. The interesting thing is that wasn't created using a vinyl record. Guitarist Tom Morello somehow created that sound with an electric guitar. Brad Wilk, Rage Against the Machine's drummer, became part of the band after unsuccessfully auditioning for the band that would later become Pearl Jam. In July 1993 at Lollapalooza 3 in Philadelphia, Rage created a silent protest against censorship by standing naked on stage for 15 minutes without singing or playing a note. Each band member has duct tape across his mouth and a letter scrawled on his chest spelling out PMRC. PMRC stood for Parents Music Resource Center, and it was the committee formed in 1985 to increase parental control over the access of music by teens. The album name Evil Empire is a reference to a term Ronald Reagan used to describe the Soviet Union in a speech he did while he was president. The album Evil Empire was produced by the band itself in conjunction with Brendan O'Brien. Brendan O'Brien has an incredible track record as an engineer and producer, and has worked with ACDC, Pearl Jam, Stone Temple Pilots, Soundgarden, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Bob Dylan, and Bruce Springsteen. Bulls on Parade was nominated for a Grammy at the Grammy Awards of 1997 in the Best Hard Rock Performance category but lost the award to the Smashing Pumpkins' Bullet with Butterfly Wings. That wraps up the story behind the song Bulls on Parade by Rage Against the Machine. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe to my channel by clicking on that little red subscribe icon in the corner. 
and please hit the like button. And stay tuned as I'll be back soon with another story behind a great rock and roll song.